Hello citizens of internet. I am Dr. Ajit Virkur from Mumbai, India. I am a professor and ex head of department of obstetrics and gynecology. This is a channel that gives something extra. This podcast is inspired by the success of my textbook which has been widely received by students and professionals alike. Each episode will delve into selected excerpts giving voice to my structured approach to topics in gynecology. whether you are a student a seasoned practitioner or simply interested in the field of gynecology i hope you will find these discussions both enlightening and engaging thank you for tuning in and let's explore the world of gynecology together welcome to this deep dive we've got some really detailed sources on endometrial hyperplasia that you've shared and today well our mission is to unpack all of that mm mm-hmm. to really boil it down and give a clear picture of what's important. Think of this as digging into the essentials based on the material provided. Absolutely. And we're leaning heavily on some solid material here specifically, excerpts from Professor Ajit Verkhud's textbook Modern Gynecology. Mm-hmm. He's uh obviously a well-respected name. Right. And we're also drawing from episode 8 of his podcast, which gives us, you know, a direct line to his way of explaining things. Okay, perfect. So let's jump right in. The big question first. What is endometrial hyperplasia? If someone's just heard this term, what does it actually mean? Good starting point. So essentially, Professor Verkhud defines it as an abnormal um overgrowth of the glands in the endometrium, that's the uterus lining. Okay. Relative to the supporting tissue, the stroma. So you end up with a higher ratio of glands to stroma than you'd normally see in the first part of the menstrual cycle. More glands than usual basically. Exactly. And it's important to know this overgrowth isn't always uniform. It could be just in one spot kind of patchy or it might cover the whole lining. And uh the degree of overgrowth varies too. So it's like the lining's balance is thrown off. Why is this specific kind of overgrowth something we need to pay attention to? Well, the main reason really is its significance down the line. In some cases these changes, this overgrowth, it can potentially progress. Progress to something more serious? Yes, potentially. and we'll definitely get into the specifics of that risk later on. Understood. So, before we go further, how common is this? Do we have numbers on prevalence? The sources mention some figures. We do. The overall incidence seems to be somewhere between uh 133 and 208 cases for every 100,000 women years. Uh that gives a ballpark. But what's really interesting is how it changes with age. For hyperplasia without atypia that covers the simple and complex types, it tends to peak in women aged say 50 to 54. Right. But for hyperplasia with atypia, the peak age is later, more like 60 to 64. Hmm, that age difference is quite notable. Does it suggest different causes or risks kicking in? It certainly raises that question, yeah. Different factors might be more dominant at different life stages, and the sources break it down further by type. Right? Yes, specific rates. Exactly. So simple hyperplasia is around 142 per 100,000 women years. Complex is higher at 213. and then atypical hyperplasia is lower about 56 per 100,000 gives you a sense of the proportions okay to really get what's abnormal we need that baseline the normal picture you mentioned the gland to stroma ratio earlier how does that normally work in the cycle right that ratio is key so in the first half of the cycle the proliferative phase when estrogen's dominant normally less than 50% of the tissue is glands okay less than half then after ovulation in the secretory phase progesterone kicks in and the glands become more developed so the ratio goes up usually over 50%. Understanding that normal ebb and flow helps see where hyperplasia deviates. And the source uses this really great analogy to explain the hormones the fertilizer lawnmower one. I thought that painted a really clear picture. Can you walk us through that? Oh yeah, it's quite clever. Professor Verkhud imagines the uterus as the uteri gardenalis, right? And the lining, the endometrium is the endometrium gracilis like grass. Okay, grass in the garden. And this grass loves the fertilizer, which is estrogen coming from the ovaries. Now, to keep this garden tidy, you need the lawnmower, which is progesterone. Exactly, Mr. or Mrs. Progesterone. Mm. They do the monthly mowing, the shedding. But and this is crucial, the lawnmower only works when it gets orders from Mr. Ovulation. Uh-huh. So, in hypoplasia, the lawnmower isn't getting the orders. Precisely. Mr. Ovulation isn't sending the signal, maybe because ovulation isn't happening regularly, that's an ovulation. So the lawnmower progesterone stays parked, but the fertilizer keeps coming. Right. Estrogen, the fertilizer is still there. So the grass just keeps growing unchecked, untrimmed. That leads to that overgrowth, the hyperplasia. Makes sense. 
And the analogy even includes things like tamoxifen, doesn't it? It does. Tamoxifen gets cast as this like extra potent, maybe even weird fertilizer. Okay. That makes the grass grow, but maybe irregularly, causing holes, which represent cysts forming in the lining. And then the analogy takes it further to the potential long-term outcome if this goes on too long. Yeah, if the mowing never happens, the lawn becomes this unruly and yellowish-brown expanse, basically totally overgrown and unhealthy. Not a good state for the garden. Not at all. Yeah. And then uh, the analogy uses the idea of dry, windy conditions, maybe representing other cell changes where the whole thing can catch fire. A metaphor for cancer development. A powerful one, yes. Yeah. It really drives home how that persistent imbalance, that lack of the mowing, can potentially lead to endometrial cancer over time. That analogy really clarifies the hormone roles. Now, a really common fear for someone getting this diagnosis must be, is this cancer? How does the source distinguish hyperplasia from actual cancer or neoplasia? That's a critical point. Professor Verkud stresses the difference. Hyperplasia is about more cells, an increase in number. Neoplasia is about uncontrolled autonomous growth. So different kinds of growth. Yes. Hyperplasia isn't cancer itself, mm. but, and this is the important, but if it's not managed, especially certain types, it can sometimes progress to neoplasia. It can be a step on that path for some people. Okay, so what's the root cause then? The etiology, what fundamentally drives that initial overgrowth? It really boils down to one main thing, unopposed estrogen. Meaning, the endometrium is being stimulated by estrogen, but without enough progesterone to balance it out to provide that mowing effect. That hormonal imbalance is the core issue. And the sources list quite a few things that can lead to that imbalance, right? Risk factors. Oh, definitely. Several key risk factors are mentioned. Uh, chronic inovulation, not ovulating regularly is a big one. Right. Obesity is another because fat tissue actually produces a type of estrogen, estrone. Ah. Polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS that often involves hormonal imbalances too. Then there's estrogen replacement therapy, specifically if it's given without progesterone to someone who still has their uterus. Unopposed estrogen, literally. Exactly. Tamoxifen, as we talked about with the analogy. Mm -hmm. Also certain rare ovarian tumors that produce estrogen, like granulosa cell tumors. Okay. And even things that just mean more lifetime estrogen exposure overall, like starting periods very early. We're going through menopause late. Wow, quite a range of factors. The source also touches on genetics playing a role sometimes. Yes, it estimates that genetics might be involved in maybe 20% of cases. Lynch syndrome is mentioned specifically. And a gene called PTN. Right, the PTN gene. Yeah. This gene is normally a break on cell growth. Mm -hmm. It helps regulate a pathway called PI3KKT. Okay. If there's a mutation in P10N, like sometimes happens in Lynch syndrome or other situations, that break doesn't work properly. So growth signals get through too easily. Exactly. The PI3KK pathway gets overactive. It can lead to more estrogen receptors being expressed. And the endometrium becomes sort of hyper-responsive to estrogen's growth signals. So it's like the soil is genetically more fertile in a way. Interesting. So a mix of hormonal environment and sometimes underlying genetics. Okay, let's switch to symptoms. How would someone even know they might have this? What should they look out for? The most common red flag is definitely abnormal uterine bleeding. What does that look like? It can be really varied, uh, heavier periods than usual, bleeding between periods, periods that last much longer, or just bleeding that's totally irregular and unpredictable. Basically, any change from what's normal for that individual. But the source also says some women might not have bleeding symptoms. That's a really important point, yes. Some women don't have changes in their bleeding patterns. So just having regular periods doesn't completely rule it out, though bleeding is the most common sign. Good to know. What about the opposite, really light bleeding? Is that a symptom? No, the source is clear on that. Scanty bleeding is not typical of hyperplasia. It also mentions that bleeding after menopause is increasingly how this presents. Postmenopausal bleeding. Right. And Professor Verkud apparently has another discussion focused just on that topic for those interested. Okay. But it's reassuring that most postmenopausal bleeding isn't due to hyperplasia, correct? That's right. While it needs investigation, only a small fraction of postmenopausal bleeding cases turn out to be hyperplasia. Most causes are benign, like atrophy. Got it. Okay, so if hyperplasia is suspected, how do doctors classify it? The source mentioned the WHO classification from 2014. Yes, the World Health Organization system. It basically divides hyperplasia into two main types based on what the cells look like under the microscope. Which are? Hyperplasia without atypia, sometimes called typical hyperplasia, and hyperplasia with atypia, 
or atypical hyperplasia. Atypia being the key difference. Yeah. What does without atypia look like microscopically? So without atypia means the glands look abnormal. They might vary a lot in size and shape. Some might be dilated and look like cysts. Cystoglandular, is that the term? Yeah. If there are lots of those dilated glands, you might see that term. The glands might be crowded in places, but the cells themselves, the cells lining the glands, they don't look particularly worrisome or atypical. Mm. The stroma, the supporting tissue, is usually reduced and dense. Okay. And how does with atypia differ? What makes it atypical? Atypical hyperplasia is, well, more concerning. The glands often have a more complex structure, more crowded and irregular. But the really key thing is the cells lining the glands show atypia. Meaning? Meaning the cells themselves look abnormal. They might be more rounded, losing their neat alignment. Their nuclei, the control centers of the cells look different too, often larger, with changes in the chromatin pattern and more prominent nucleoli. These are signs of more significant cellular disturbance. And this distinction with or without atypia sounds crucial because... The risk of it turning into cancer is very different, isn't it? Hugely different. The source outlines a kind of potential progression, maybe starting with just proliferative endometrium, then developing hyperplasia without atypia, often leads to that PT mutation we talked about. Right. Which can then progress to hyperplasia with atypia, and that in turn can progress to endometrioid carcinoma, the most common type of endometrial cancer. Other genes like KRAS and PIK3CA also get involved along the way. So what are the actual risk numbers? For hyperplasia without atypia, the risk of it progressing to cancer over, say, 20 years is quite low, estimated around 1% to 3%. Okay, relatively low. But for hyperplasia with atypia, it's a completely different story. The risk is much, much higher. The source states that up to 50%, half of women diagnosed with atypical hyperplasia, who then have a hysterectomy, are actually found to already have an underlying cancer present in the uterus. Wow, 50%. That really highlights why getting the diagnosis right is so critical. Absolutely. It dictates the entire management approach. So how do doctors confirm the diagnosis? It seems like imaging and sampling are both in fault. Exactly. Professor Verkud points out that while the final answer comes from looking at the tissue itself, a histologic diagnosis. From a biopsy. Right. But transvaginal ultrasound, the pelvic ultrasound, is really vital as a first step. What are they looking for on the ultrasound? The main thing is the thickness of the endometrial lining. In women who are having symptoms, like abnormal bleeding, a lining that looks diffusely thickened, usually more than 10 millimeters, is suspicious. And for postmenopausal women? The threshold is lower. Anything over 5 millimeters is generally considered abnormal and needs further investigation. And the source is specific about how to measure thickest point, perpendicular, excluding any fluid in the cavity. Okay. What about other imaging like CT or MRI? Are they standard? Not routinely for the initial diagnosis, according to this material. There isn't enough evidence yet to say they add significant value over ultrasound and sampling for standard hyperplasia management. So after the ultrasound, the next step is usually getting that tissue sample. The source talks about doing it in the office versus a surgical procedure. Mm, correct. Often, the first step is an office endometrial biopsy usually done with a thin, flexible tube called a pipel. No anesthesia needed, generally well tolerated. Okay. But it's important to realize this gives more of a cytological sample looking at individual cells, like a pap smear, rather than a full histopathological picture showing the tissue structure. Though the results do tend to correlate well with more extensive sampling. So when would surgical sampling be necessary? And what's this global curatage idea Professor Verkud mentions? Surgical sampling, usually a DNC, dilation and curatage, is needed if the office sample wasn't adequate, didn't get enough tissue, or if someone keeps bleeding even after a negative office biopsy. Okay, makes sense. But global curatage, this is something Professor Verkud strongly advocates for. He argues that a standard DNC where they might just take a few strips of tissue could potentially miss a small patch of hyperplasia or even an early cancer. Because it might be focal. Exactly. So global curatage means meticulously sampling the entire surface of the endometrial cavity, really making sure to get into the corners, the corneal regions, which are sometimes missed. Thoroughness is key. Absolutely. And he even suggests sending the entire collected sample to pathology, sometimes even dividing it between two different experienced pathologists, just to maximize the chance of catching anything significant. It really emphasizes how crucial accurate pathology is. Definitely. Okay, so once the diagnosis is confirmed, and crucially, whether there's atypia or not, how is it treated? 
Let's start with hyperplasia without atypia. Right. For hyperplasia without atypia, the first step is always good counseling. Reassuring the patient that the cancer risk is low, that it might even resolve on its own, or that treatment is usually very effective. And addressing risk factors. Yes, absolutely. If there are reversible factors like obesity or maybe adjusting hormone therapy, it's important. Mm. Then, if it doesn't resolve or if the woman's having problematic bleeding, progestogen therapy is the mainstay. Observation with follow-up biopsies is also an option sometimes. What kind of progestogen treatments are used? There are options. Mm -hmm. Oral pills like medroxyprogesterone, acetate, or norethistrone taken daily for at least six months usually. Okay. There are also injectable forms like Depo MPA every couple of months. But, and this is a key point from the guidelines mentioned, like SOGC and RCRG, the preferred first-line treatment nowadays is off of the levonorgestrel releasing intramoderin device, the LNG IUD. The hormonal IUD, why is that preferred? Several reasons. It delivers the progestogen directly to the endometrium where it's yeah. needed. Right, locally. Which means much less gets absorbed systemically, so fewer potential side effects compared to pills or injections. Plus, it's convenient no daily pills last for five, even seven years sometimes. That sounds like a significant advantage. It really is. After about six months of treatment, whichever method is used, a repeat biopsy is needed to check if the hyperplasia has regressed. And you can often do that biopsy, the PayPal, even with the IUD still in place. If it has regressed, the IUD can just stay in for continued effect. Long term, management depends on the individual, their ongoing risks. If someone has persistent obesity, for instance, they might need continued monitoring or another IUD later. But overall, medical management for hyperplasia without atypia has a very high success rate. Okay, that's encouraging. Now, shifting gears to hyperplasia with atypia, given that much higher risk we discussed, the treatment must be quite different. Drastically different, yes. Because of that significant risk of underlying cancer or progression to cancer, the standard recommendation for hyperplasia with atypia is a total hysterectomy. Removal of the uterus. Yes, and usually the fallopian tubes and ovaries as well, though removing the ovaries in premenopausal women requires careful discussion about hormone replacement, and long-term health. Right, balancing risks and benefits. Yeah, exactly. Now, if someone strongly refuses surgery, there is an alternative, though it's considered less ideal. It involves using a hysteroscope to surgically resect or remove the entire endometrial lining, followed by progesterone therapy. It aims to reduce risk, but hysterectomy is definitely the preferred route due to the high stakes. Understood. So, wrapping up the key takeaways here, High suspicion, using ultrasound, getting that crucial tissue sample for diagnosis, mm -hmm. and then treatment really hinges on whether atypia is present or not. Precisely. As Professor Verkud sums it up, clinical suspicion, ultrasound, and a low threshold for sampling are vital for diagnosis. And getting that diagnosis early and starting the right intervention is key to preventing endometrial cancer. And for hyperplasia without atypia, remember that LNG IUD is now really considered the go-to first-line treatment. This has been incredibly helpful, really breaking down a complex topic from those detailed sources. Thanks for walking us through it so clearly. My pleasure. Happy to discuss it. So reflecting on all this, the hormones, the genetics, the different types, the varying risks, it really makes you think, doesn't it? Considering how complex this interplay is, where might we be headed in the future? Could we see maybe more personalized screening or prevention based on someone's specific hormonal milieu or genetic markers? It feels like a really interesting area for future development in gynecological care. Something to ponder. Mm -hmm. And for everyone listening, we hope this deep dive has been informative. If any of this resonates with you or raises questions, definitely have a conversation with your healthcare provider. That's it for this deep dive. We'll catch you on the next one.